My name is Joe Cernick. I'm a member of the faculty here at Lindenwood University. Now, uh, this is a show called Insight, and we discuss books on politics, usually sometimes domestic, sometimes uh, foreign policy books, uh, sometimes books that are historical that provide sort of an insight into the present, and sometimes broader atmospheric or trend analysis books. Uh, today's book is really on domestic politics. It's written by a man named Mark Lilla. And the title of his book is called The Once and Future Liberal After Identity Politics. Now, joining me on the show today are two Lindenwood University students. To my uh, immediate right is James Heckler. And to James' right is Johnny Petticore. Now, I wanted to read an opening quote from the book, and then we'll jump into a discussion about it. The author writes, American liberalism in the 21st century is in a crisis, a crisis of imagination and ambition on our side, a crisis of attachment and trust on the side of the wider public. The majority of Americans have made it abundantly clear that they no longer respond to whatever larger message we have been conveying over the past decades. I write as a frustrated American liberal. My frustration is not directed at Donald Trump voters. My frustration has its source in an ideology that for decades has prevented liberals from developing an ambitious vision of America and its future that would inspire citizens of every walk of life. I would definitely agree with that statement. I mean, as we have seen over the last couple of years since Trump has run for president and also has been president, they really haven't done a good job of promoting a set platform like the Republican Party has. It's been sort of an air of anti-Trump, anti-Republican, you name it. I mean, a great example of that would be the 2018 State of the Union address where Trump mentioned investing over a trillion dollars in infrastructure and rather than being supportive of that, the Democrats really just sat there and decided we're just going to go against Trump simply because we don't like him. Sure. I, I think that, that it holds true that the, the liberal ideology now has become so fractionalized it's starting to eat itself. I think it's become such, um, so, so for lack of a better term, diverse that they can't get on the same page and therefore they can't go out and talk to even non-liberals or people that are on the fence about issues because it's no longer about issues, it's about identity now. And when you focus solely on your own identity, you tend to exclude other people uh, from that identity. And you're either an ally to my identity or you're an opposition to my, my identity. And that, that doesn't get anybody on the same page in order to, to uh, provide growth and uh, a vision for Americans and, and everybody in regard to the, the common good. First, I think the thing that makes the book thoughtful is the fact that he isn't sort of trying to focus just on Donald Trump or Donald Trump voters and somehow denigrate them. Sure. So in this sense, he's trying to look more broadly. Yeah, the, the notion, which I've agreed with for years, and I know I've discussed this on television and even written about it, this identity politics means we're going to identify people in almost fractured ways. Here's an African-American woman, so what is she feeling that possibly a white male can't possibly feel, and we're going to focus over here on somebody who's gay, and we're going to, rather than, think, wait a minute, what, what sort of things do you have in common? Sure. And so I think uh, that Obama actually at times didn't do a very good job of ever expressing, well, what do you have in common regarding health care problems? So, for example, I wrote about this and I discussed it on TV frequently. It was the notion that you sit and go, I'm not going to support his health care program, the Affordable Care Act, which I'm calling Obamacare, because he's forcing me to buy insurance. I'm going, well, somebody has to pay for your insurance. You, you want to still have be treated at a hospital. You don't want to buy insurance, but you want me to pay for your because essentially what happens with a hospital or insurance company is they're going to jack up my rates because of these group of people, high percentage, that want to still go to the hospital but then not pay their bills. And so he could never convey some basic messages 
and I think he got caught in the identity politics. That's one of the issues I found with the Democratic Party over the last eight years, both under the Obama administration and now as we see under the current Trump administration, is this idea of identity politics, where it's a theory that tries to cause a division amongst Americans rather than just saying Americans and ge American citizens in general. They say things like Latino Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans, members of the LGBTQ community, etc. Whereas I think a good example in the book was where he talked about the comparison and contrast between the Republican Party's pa web page and the Democratic Party's page. The Republican Party basically states everyone as all Americans and everything, whereas the Democratic page tends to divide people up in people, Asian Americans, African Americans, Latinos, whatever. I think one of the, the big solutions, his big conclusion was that we need to start focusing, or that liberalism as a whole needs to start focusing on citizenship, not on uh, different factions of the same group of people, of the, uh, whether it's humanity, Americans, liberals. Um, we need to focus on citizenship being the one thing that ties us all together, whether you're an African American, whether you're part of the LGBT community, we're all citizens of the same country. He doesn't make any normative descriptions as to uh, what it takes to be a citizen or uh, excluding immigrants from that process or what have you. He talks about everybody being a citizen and that should come first and we should realize as liberals what we owe each other and can do for each other in order to further our goals and, and to enact the greater good. Right. Yeah, I think the term liberal, it certainly has become uh, sort of a, a bad word sure. to say it. And, and he's trying to say you can take time to develop it. I mean in the sense of saying liberal or liberalish, and that what do you mean? I, the idea of just sort of then you can, allowing it to sort of say, and then I'm going to allow somebody that doesn't like it to define it, as opposed to taking the time to explain, wait a minute, we want to explain that we have some problems in common. And, and I listened to, I, Hillary Clinton, I don't think, did very good speeches in 2016. I listened, I thought, oh my goodness, you know, she was nothing like her husband. That he seemed to know how to have a conversation. She would make a speech. He would have a conversation. She'd make a speech, certainly at the Democratic National Convention when I heard him speak. And then she gets up and talks. He's having a conversation. She's making a speech. It, and that right there to me. Sure, and that, and that conversation's important. One of the things that he, he talks about, one of the things that I tend to agree with, too, as someone who's, who is a, a political science uh, student and somebody who's aspiring to get into politics is that you're no longer having a conversation anymore. It's, it's us versus them. It's, it's, and what do you, and Jordan Peterson even said this, what do you call someone that you can't talk to? If they're your enemy. Yeah. Uh, so there's no longer this conversation. There's no longer this compromise that's being willing, that's willing to be had. There's no longer this common ground that everybody's trying to, to find with this give and take on both sides, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, a liberal or conservative. It's become an us versus them, and no matter what you say, I'm not going to listen because I have my principles as a conservative or a liberal, uh, and you're the enemy. Exactly. I would definitely agree with that statement. I mean, like what you mentioned where Hillary started talking, giving her speech at the Democratic National Convention versus Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton would try to unite everyone together toward a common goal. Whereas Hillary, again, as normal, she seemed to have continued to cause a divide amongst the Democrats as well. There was also the issue with the superdelegates, so that was an issue as well. That superdelegate issue, I'll just mention it here, uh, which was a big issue. In other words, that superdelegates essentially almost have the deciding power after you've had primaries and caucuses. And as a result, the issue in 2016, the superdelegates sort of all lined up in favor of Hillary Clinton. What the Democrats have now done uh, is, and I think it's still a continuous process, but they're trying to reduce uh, the number of superdelegates. So in 2020, they may matter less. Uh, how much less, I'm not quite sure, because it still seems to be like they're moving in the direction of trying to actually reduce the delegates. I don't know what that's going to do for the process of determining who the Democratic candidate running for president will be in 2020 if you suddenly say, well, there's super delegates, but they're not mattering as much as they did in 2016 or 12 or 8, et cetera, et cetera, going way back. Suddenly, 
they may matter very little. So I don't know how that's going to affect the process and wonder how that might play out in terms of identity politics. Sure. One of the things that, he, that Dr. Lilla brought up in his book was that the Democrats are no longer focused on local politics anymore. They're no longer focused on electoral politics. Mm -hmm. They're no longer fo focused on getting city council members in and getting mayors in and getting governors in. They're constantly, and for the last several, several election cycles, have been putting in these un almost unpalatable national Democrats that people and and no matter who you come from, even the the left says these uh, I'm not voting for this person. This is this is reprehensible um, be, because they're not focusing on local politics and and forcing change at the ground level. They they go straight for the top, and I think that um, and he agrees that that's a theme I see in a number of uh, criticisms of the Democratic Party. He brings it up also that. You, you got to focus on first. Let's look on the local stage, sure. and let's look on the state stage. And he sort of felt that wasn't. So now you're wondering: is that a change we might be seeing this year, which in some cases might be a reaction to Trump in the White House? I don't know. We'll see how it plays out in the 2018 congressional elections. I would definitely agree with that. It, you kind of have to look back, and if you look at the old term grassroots politics. <laughs> It basically starts from the ground up, start with your local elec local elections, city councils, whatever, and then you work your way up. Like Johnny said, I definitely agree with him on this, but lately the Democrats have just gone absolutely to the tip top. They tried to elect these seemingly radical presidents. There's a bunch of people, who, lots of Democrats who don't like Hillary Clinton. A lot of them dislike Bernie Sanders as well, whereas the Republicans have definitely take an approach of starting from the ground up and working their way to the top. That's basically how the party of Abraham Lincoln got started way back in the late 1850s. They it's started an outgrowth of the Whig party. Sure. Yeah, yes. and one of the things that he talks about was how Trump seized an opportunity that uh, a, a, a large portion of the American population was disenfranchised because of liberal ideology under like you had said Obama had kind of fractionalized everybody to the point where there was this this population in the middle who felt like they were they didn't have a country they didn't have an identity they didn't have a a common ground with any of these fringes or these margins of the democrat party and i think trump will love him or hate him saw that as an opportunity to appeal to those people and bring them into the republican and on the right side of things now what the author is saying is he's seeing these two great sort of eras or movements since the 1930s. So you have the Franklin Delano Roosevelt movement, New Deal, and then as a result there's a unification that he says this transcends this identity politics, but sooner or later it disintegrates, it declines, mm -hmm. and that you begin to have a breaking apart. And then he says the next one is Reaganism. And uh, so he's sort of pointing out that the uh, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt movement and the New Deal and how it lasted after came as a result of the crisis of the Great Depression of the 1930s, so you had to come together to work things out. Absolutely. Reaganism comes as a result of the problems of the 1970s, so there's a number of people watching the show that can't remember or uh, were too young to be aware of the problems America had in the 70s, high constant unemployment, high inflation, uh, gas prices that were going through the roof. And so as a result, there was a great deal of economic uh, chaos. And so Reaganism in the 80s is sort of an outgrowth of the problems of the 70s. But he points out Reaganism is now collapsing, sure. just like the the aftermath of the uh, Franklin Roosevelt New Deal uh, development. And so uh, he looks at this and sees this and sort of now says you, you have time to readjust. Where are we headed? One of the things that he brought up about Reaganism, or about the Reaganism dispensation, um, is that Re Reaganism and Reagan himself focused on the individual and focused on uh, individual growth and identity and wealth and entrepreneurship and he said that that's kind of the way liberalism has kind of evolved now where you focus inward on yourself. Uh, he blames um, that concept on the retreat of liberals into universities, into these closed off microcosms of liberalism where they can focus on themselves and, and being a liberal and focus on their identity as opposed to focus on what it means to be a liberal outside of that again, microcosm.
I think what's really interesting to note is that during the mid to late 1970s, the Republican Party itself was in a state of disarray and just a bunch of little pocket groups mm -hmm. just under this big umbrella known as the Republican Party. That's what we see with the Democratic Party now. Whereas what Reagan did was he was able to unite all those groups together and set towards a common goal. So the Democrats really need to find someone who can unite them all once again. Yeah, these quotes he has, uh, there can be no liberal politics without a sense of we. And what we as citizens uh, and what we owe each other. And then he says, this does not mean a return to the New Deal. Uh, future liberals cannot be like the liberals of the past. Too much has changed. And so that idea is how do you then look at sort of what it is you're going to do. It's not sort of, okay, we're going to go back and only have very big government programs. Because I know in the book he's uh, somewhat critical of the Great Society era of Lyndon sure. Johnson in the 1960s where you created a number of programs and he said they were oversold that you assumed you got to do a great deal. You did some good, but you couldn't do massive good. And so you have to know how to sell something in a way to say, we're going to try to do something, however, and then you're going to be talking about the limitations of what you're doing. Sure, and I, I contend, though, uh, as to his point about uh, LBJ's uh, new society, or great society, uh, it did get, to be fair to LBJ, it did get derailed by the Vietnam War and the escalation of the Vietnam War. I think that he does bring up a good point that you, there's never an again in politics. There's always only the future. There's never going back to the past. Um, but to, to be fair, I think that the liberal ideology can take a page out of, um, out of the Great Society book and out of the New Deal book in that we address each other as citizens and not as groups of different identities. Yeah, his quote, I like, the paradox of identity liberalism is that it paralyzes the capacity to think and act in a way that would actually accomplish the things it professes to want. Mm -hmm. It is mesmerized by symbols, achieving superficial diversity in organizations, retelling history to focus on marginal and often minuscule groups. And so people will probably not like to hear that. Uh, sure. Bill no, Clinton not. tried to do that to some extent when he was running for president. He appeared at the Rainbow Coalition that Jesse Jackson had and in his speech he was very critical of uh, uh, African Americans in certain ways and he was trying to sort of uh, create a situation. I understood what he was doing. Uh, he was trying to sort of say we got to look more broadly at everything and it was like you ended up having then a number of African Americans highly critical of the idea how, no, 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 you got to focus on us. And some of them it decided that they still held it against Hillary Clinton when she ran. We're not showing up to the polls to vote. Sure. And you're sitting there thinking, uh, so you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. You, you didn't want Trump, but you're not willing to go polls to vote for Clinton, even though you don't support him, but you sort of support her policies, but you're still mad at the policies he developed as president, so you're going to hold her again. And so you go there and think, don't you know how to think politically? And, and he's in the book is trying to say politics is about some degree of pragmatism. Sure, and, and again to that point, he talks about um, how every identity group in this, in this movement politics era is vying for what they can get. It's mm -hmm. always, well, we want this because we're the, the African American community, and you gave it to the LBG, L LGBT community, and the LGBT community is like, don't look at them, look at us, look what we want, what we need, and then you have um, uh, third wave feminism also into the, it's become this intersectional postmodernism yeah. mess where everybody wants what they want and doesn't want the other, other group of marginalized people to or have to what they want. I understand you have certain common things. Sure, yeah. Right, exactly. I, for one, know of a really good example. I'm actually a union worker, so the thing with the UAW that I've seen lately is they really don't want to compromise between what the Democrats are pushing and what the Republicans are pushing. For example, the Republicans, and under the new Trump tax plan, he wants to deduct taxes on certain individuals, such as large employers. And the result of that is corporations such as Chrysler can now invest more money 
into the United States and build up their factories, which provides more jobs for American workers. But yet, for some reason, they still seem to follow behind the Democrats and what they want to do, and along with sort of the anti-Trump ideology. Hmm. Yeah, that feeling of how do you create a commonality to say well, you got some common problems and it's missing. I like the section in the book actually where he says uh, sort of democratic or liberal activists are now too much in the universities. Yes. And they're not sort of the guy in the street who understands that they're the ones and and so that he had a whole section in the book about this is a problem that the fact that you're looking at democratic activists in universities alone and not out there doing all different walks of life. Exactly. And, and so he said you've got to get away from that. Yes. He talked about uh, li the liberal professors and stuff uh, back in the, in the 70s used to say, you talk about the anti-war movement and, mm -hmm. and the civil rights movement and things going on out there. And look what's going on out there. We are going to prepare you to deal with with issues out there. Mm -hmm. And he said that there's been a, a switch in the paradigm where it's turned into identity, who are you as a person, mm -hmm. yourself, me, I, the individual. And it's created this cognitive dissonance between when they get out of the university where they're no longer in this little microcosm. They don't know how to deal with people of differing mm -hmm. perceptions. I would definitely agree with that statement. Like you said a long time ago, about 50 years ago, there were individuals who were out working in their fields, be it you know farmers, factory workers, etc. Now what we have, of course, like you said, are these liberal ideologists who are both literally and figuratively unattached from the outside world in the, the world of liberal academia, where there's nothing wrong with studying and coming up with new political theories, but the problem is there really isn't a whole lot of outside on the job experience sure, yeah. when practicing these ideas. The opportunity, uh, which is what he's sort of saying exists, because he says Republicans since Trump's election are in disarray and intellectually bankrupt. Most Americans now recognize that Reagan's shining city upon a hill has turned into Rust Belt towns with long shuttered shops. And so then as a result, there's an opportunity to do something. Mm -hmm. And, and I think what he's trying to say is both sides have an opportunity to do something. He's hoping that the Democrats do it better than the Republicans, which is basically what he's trying to say. So as a result, whatever the Republicans currently have now is as bad as the Democrats have now. So who's going to jump on the bandwagon and, and do it in a well way, which is why he says our message can and should be simple. We are a republic, not a campsite. Sure. And basically the problem is is that you're still doing that campsite where I'm a woman and I know things that you can't know as a man and as a result I can feel it and I can talk about it, I can do it, but you can't, you know, and so you don't want to do this feeling of well what is it you have in common? It's common problems. Sure. How do you talk about it? And you don't hear that. No, he talks about, you know, again, superficial diversity and everybody's focusing on these these superficial aspects of themselves and not what makes them a citizen and what, what makes, uh, what gives them common ground with another person, albeit they might be a different race, different gender, different sexual orientation. What do we have in common as human beings and what can we do together to enact the greater good? Something that's mutually beneficial for both of us. I think that that aspect of politics, of that compromise, that pragmatism and that egalitarianism uh, has, has kind of left the building over the last 50 years. This term he uses, dispensation. So he's saying you have the Franklin Roosevelt dispensation, you have the Reagan dispensation. By that he means feelings and perceptions. And so it's sort of not a movement per se, there's a broader sense that you're looking at, yeah, I feel that, I'm part of that Reagan sort of saying that bright and shiny day, the moment upon the hill, the sunshine has risen whatever terminology Reagan would use, but you felt you were part of it and you could feel it even if things hadn't changed. But you felt some sort of a change. And so this is what he's saying is needed is this dispensation. You want to create perception and feeling to be feeling like you're part of something. And it takes a lot of great communication skills to be able to convey those ideas out. That's why FDR and Reagan were such good good at conveying these ideas 
because FDR took to forms like radio all the time. He was one of the first presidents to use radio as his main primary form of communication with the American public, and Reagan would use television later on. That's one thing that presidents in, pre in previous times have not been able to do very effectively. So with the advent of technology and a great way to communicate with the American public, you're able to convey these ideas that may last 30 plus years. I, I remember as a kid that when Frank, uh, Eisenhower was president, who I met uh, in 1961 on a golf course, so I got his signature in my office, but uh, there was a discussion uh, that I remember, how, should he be limited in how much time he should be on television because maybe that will work against him. And so you ended up having this sort of a problem. Um, the, we only have a few minutes left. What do you think of this book? I think the book does a really good job of analyzing both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, both on their current state and where they should be heading in the future if they want to continue conveying their political ideology without basically alienating all members within their envelope of their parties and self-destructing. I thought this was probably the best book I've read all year. I think that it should be mandatory reading for anybody in a political science major. Um, I think it was great to read a book about liberalism from a liberal. I think uh, too much we see uh, conservatives writing books about liberals, liberals writing books about conservatives, and it's just uh, 200 pages of a bash session. Uh, and he, you don't see him using any platitudes or pointing fingers. He really kind of looks inward and says, this is, and he also comes up with a solution to the problem. He doesn't just gripe for 200 pages about solution being being that we need to focus on citizenship not our own personal identities and, mm -hmm. and unite the liberal side of things and not just uh, focus on um, superficial externalisms yeah um, obviously that he realizes you have stuff like Fox News because he discusses it and that you're going to try to present a message and so it's going to be undercut mm -hmm. so that you have a problem where there is this huge vocal uh, sort of uh, conservative or Republican-leaning uh, radio and television that can undercut you. So you're trying to figure out how do you overcome that and present some broader messages. But first, you have to have the messages to be able to talk to, in a way to say, I'm trying to reach out. And uh, I, I think he does a fairly good job of at least trying to make you feel, yeah, you know, there's a lack of of pragmatism, there's a lack of broader thinking. As I sit down, I listen to politicians talk, and I go, ugh, darn them. I don't want to listen to you talk anymore. Sure. You have nothing good to say. Good short book. Thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm.